Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, the greatest live broadcast in all of YouTube. What we try to do for you here on Getting Sketchy is either myself or the other artist, Ashley, we try to create a drawing for you inside of 45 minutes. And in this season, which is season 11, it's all about creating art in the style of other artists. And uh, so far we have done Magritte, uh, Janet Fish, uh, Andy Warhol, Picasso, uh, Pernese, and- Edward Hopper. Edward Hopper. Salvador Dali. And Salvador Dali. And tonight, we oh, are going to be Vincent doing- Oh, and Vincent Van Gogh. Did you say oh, Vincent, Vincent Van Gogh? Did we do- Oh, yeah, and Van Gogh. We started with Van yeah, Gogh. Yeah, yeah, and Van Gogh. Yeah. Uh, so we've covered quite a number of artists. Uh, tonight is the last uh, the last broadcast in this series where we're actually drawing. Um, and next week we will have a follow-up episode where we critique all the drawings that we created this season, so a total of 10. And Ash is gonna be doing the drawing tonight and he's eagerly waiting right over there. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing very well, Matt. Thank you for asking. And I hope you folks are doing well also. I'm super excited about tonight. I've actually been excited about the whole season. This has been a really fun season with the in the style of theme. But uh, tonight we're going to look at some maybe some lesser known art by uh, Surratt just because he's so famous for his style of painting. But we're going to look at his drawings and try to create a drawing that's in his style. And our materials play a big role in that. Absolutely. Um, and before we get into it, I'd just like to remind you, if you are new to this channel or if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell so you're notified when new videos are posted and also when we go live like this. And uh, make sure you like this video. If you enjoy what we do here, make sure you give it a like. That'll help other people find the videos, uh, of course. And uh, if you want to take your drawing and painting skills to another level, then uh, you are missing out if you do not take a look at the membership program that we offer over at thevirtualinstructor.com. The membership program includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subject matter and media. There's 21 total courses, and these courses are way more in depth than a lot of the courses you'll find out there. Not just one demonstration, but several demonstrations are included in each one of the courses, along with illustrated eBooks, which are also part of the courses. We do weekly live lessons. So the live lessons are different from getting sketchy. We do complete pieces of artwork from start to finish and they go week by week. Uh, each live lesson is an hour long and they're all recorded and stored in our vault. They go all the way back to 2012 when I first started broadcasting live. Mm -hmm. There's also weekly critiques as part of the members minute and there's a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers and includes all the resources you need to teach in your classroom all of that is included in the membership program and uh, it's very reasonably priced and on top of that uh, everyone starts out with a week-long trial for free so you can check out the program see if it's right for you and then beyond that there's a 30-day money-back guarantee so you really uh, can't go wrong there. There's a link in the description below this video if you want to check out the membership program. If you want to get on our mailing list and also check out three of our course videos and ebooks, there's a link in the description below for that. You'll get a lot of free lessons sent to your email box. And you'll also get three course videos and ebooks sent to your email box as well, or a link to get to those uh, videos and ebooks as well. Again, a link for both of those, the membership program and the free course videos and ebooks, and also being put on our mailing list is in the description below. I've also put links to the materials Ashley is gonna be using tonight in the description below too. So if you wanna check that out and uh, use the same materials, because Ashley's gonna be using a little bit of a specialty paper tonight, uh, some of you might be interested in, to, in it. Uh, I've, I've placed a link in the description for that as well. Uh, Ashley, are you ready to talk about tonight's artist? Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at some artwork. Okay, uh, who is the artist? So the artist is- Oh, you already said that, right? Jose Serra. That's, the, <laughs> that's my best, the best pronunciation. Jose Serra. It's George Serrat. And I'll probably just call him George tonight um, to spare you from my attempt at a at uh, uh, correct pronunciation. So are we looking at, okay, so we're looking at one of his charcoal drawings right now. And I've always been attracted to his charcoal drawings. Of course, they're not in color. And he's most famous for the study and the work that he did about optical 
color mixing. That's right. He is the the artist that paints with dots. It's called pointillism. And he was a post-impressionist, a really transitional artist um, between the impressionists and all that came after him. So um, though he's most famous for his work with the, with the dots, I find it fascinating that he would work with uh, Conte crayon and charcoal on paper that had a pattern of dots. So here we're looking at another one that's similar to what we're going to be working with tonight, sort of a, a lonely figure or soul figure kind of looking down at what they're doing. Uh, but you can still see that heavily textured paper, a very soft feel to his, his charcoal. They're very subtle, um, smooth uh, gradations of value. So that's what attracts me uh, to his charcoal work. Um, unfortunately, Surratt, uh, he did a lot of artwork, but in a short period of time. He, he died when he was only 31 years old. So tonight, we're all 31 years old for George Surratt. And uh, here is his most famous artwork. It took him about two years to complete it. And he did, he did a lot of studies. He did smaller paintings that are very, very similar. Um, but this painting is, I believe it is titled um, Sunday Afternoon on the Island of Le Grand Jatte. Uh, which I'm told means the big bowl. So it's an, it's an, it's an island on a, on a river. And, um, you know, it's uh, again, we see sort of a style, a simplification of the details. And so we're not going to really be after um, details so much tonight as sort of that uh, smoky look. Um, even in this painting, you can see that he had really high contrast values from where the greens on the lawn are really dark or really light. And of course, if we were to zoom in, we would see a lot of pretty, I mean, it's very colorful, um, but the, uh, the points or the, the dots of color are even brighter. And the way he would sort of mix them down is to combine uh, various colors up against one another. And they, they really mix more in our brain or optically. So that was, a, that was a pretty fresh, a pretty new idea in the development of art making at the time. And uh, it's really become... Um, a concept that is, uh, it's not so groundbreaking anymore. Um, a lot of artists do it. In fact, uh, Surratt wasn't the first person interested in optical color mixing. Uh, he really kind of uh, appreciated and lo looked up to the work of Eugene Delacroix. So in a lot of ways, uh, and who, who is also one of my favorite artists that we didn't feature in this season, um, but uh, we can see those influences in Surratt's work. All right, and I'll remind you because um, I forgot to remind you that there is a chat box here uh, if you're watching this live. And we would encourage you to use a super chat function, uh, which is available on YouTube, uh, to make your comment or question a little bit more prominent and ensures that we are able to read it and address it uh, here on YouTube. It does cost a little bit of money to do a super chat, but it helps out uh, with our production costs, of course, and shows your support. So we would encourage you to do that. If you have a comment or question that's directed at myself or Ashley. All right, Ashley, you ready to start drawing? Yeah, we'll go ahead All and switch, right, we'll over, switch over. All right, this is not what we're drawing. This is actually the front of the paper, so I thought I'd talk about that a little bit first. Tonight, I'm gonna be using stipple paper from the B Paper Company. It is a strange paper. It's really heavyweight. Um, pretty thick, kind of like uh, almost like Bristol paper, Bristol board. Um, it's got a very small, tight, dotted pattern, as would be indicated, I guess, by the word stipple. It almost feels like a plastic. It, Matt, do you get that impression? I mean, it almost feels like plastic paper. Yeah, it does have kind of like a waxy Like it's got a coating surface. or something. Yeah. yeah. But uh, in, in, incidentally, uh, it says it's excellent for all dry media. And goes on to say, ideal for designing tattoos. Which not, neither one of us get. I, I don't, don't understand, understand that. that at all. Yeah. So, But if you're a tattoo artist, you might check this out, and then you can let us know how in the world it is ideal for designing tattoos. I would tattoos. think any paper would be ideal for designing tattoos. <laughs> I would, tattoos, too. Yeah. I would, too. Or maybe uh, um, a person. You know, would just work maybe on... Maybe some paper that has some transparency, you know, that would be easy to Like that transfer. vellum paper. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. I would think that would be good. But even marker paper. We're not going to design a tattoo tonight, though. We're going to yeah. be working with charcoal. <laughs> so let me go ahead and move our pad out of the way. And I already have uh, my square ready to go. We will be working in it with a square composition. So if you're getting your paper ready while I um, continue to talk, this is six inches by six inches. And I will tell you guys, if you want more information on this paper, I did do a little bit of a review on it and made a video 
uh, about it on YouTube. And uh, the video is a drawing of a black bird. And uh, I think the title is um, Stippling Without the Dots. Oh, yeah, it's perfect. Yep. Yep. You know, let the paper do the work. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to be using charcoal tonight, and I've got some compressed charcoal here. I've got a big piece, but I've also got a little piece that I'm going to be using the side of, just for a slightly broader mark, and also a lighter mark. You know, when you're um, laying down a larger surface area like the side of this small piece, you actually... Um, get lighter marks than if you use the tip of the charcoal where all of the weight of your hand is pressed into a smaller uh, a smaller area so um, that's what it's odd I'll, I'll be using the tip of the big piece and the side of the small piece for bigger marks um, and I've just got my lead holder after that I think it's got probably 2b or hb lead inside of there so pretty standard graphite that's what we'll start with we'll make a drawing of our basic shapes and then start shading from there i'm starting with some of the darkest areas first because we can't go wrong with the dark areas since we know they're pretty much black i can't mess those up and then i can use the black of the paper and the white of the paper the black um, parts of the drawing and the white of the paper to make some comparisons and hopefully drill down on some of the gray areas. So All right. I guess that's about it. Yeah, I just need to interrupt you for a second because you do have a super chat from James. James. And uh, James says, just want to say thank you. Thank you, James. We really appreciate it. We appreciate all of you guys, of course, uh, for being here tonight with us. Definitely. Okay, so um, the reference is up. I guess the timer is next. And I'm going to go ahead and move tell me materials when. out of the way. Um, before I start drawing, I will point out that um, we are drawn from a photograph, so we'll be using sort of photograph drawing techniques tonight instead of life, regular life drawing techniques, even though our subject is a person. So I'm going to start the drawing and lay in all my parts pretty much by looking at how those parts interact with the edge of our picture plane, how close they are to a corner or to the middle or how far away some of the parts are um, from the edge of our picture plane. So that's what I'll be looking at. And I would recommend that. It's a great way to um, draw when you're drawing from a photograph and when you're drawing surface, your picture plane is the same proportion as your photograph. That's important. All right. All right. I guess we're ready. You're ready. Yeah, let's Time do are starting now. Okay, here we go. We're off. So I'm going to start from the foreground and work to the background um, for this part. And then we'll kind of go in reverse when we start shading. So the seat that our subject is sitting in um, begins slightly above on the left side, the bottom left corner. And I'll just try to grab that diagonal as best I can. And while you're doing that, we do have another super chat. All from right, June. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, June. And uh, June, we we feel like we know you. Uh, she says, have loved the season, have learned so much. I'm going to have to look into an art history class. Well, That's I'm inspiring. glad that this season has inspired you to do some deeper digging into mm -hmm. art history. Yeah. I we loved, have covered quite a spectrum of I loved of my artists, art history yeah. classes. Oh, and I forgot we did... Marcel Duchamp last week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. There's actually 11 artists. Can't leave him out. Okay, so I'm, I'm foregoing the hand right now and just started with the upper, bot, upper portion of this gentleman's um, arm. And I think that uh, his shoulder comes up less than halfway up from the bottom so i'm good there and we'll get it just as close as we can we are working with a timer tonight so we want it to seem believable even if it's not entirely accurate now what's interesting is if you i'm sure you've read the the headline on the paper right yeah i did um enemy planes near new york from it's atlantic yeah, and I was wondering about that before the show started, when just exactly when this picture was it taken had to, to what that refers World War II. to. I'm assuming so. Yeah. And he's got his, the hat looks to me like it's the middle of the 20th century. Well, if the planes were coming and they were near New York and that paper had to be printed, that's some pretty slow news. <laughs> yeah, it's not, uh, it's not social media, is it? <laughs> by the time you got the news the news had changed yeah, i course, think that might be you know, i don't think that's all that bad 
All right. I think it so, would kind of be nice to be a little bit slower with Yeah, no kidding. I'd like to slow it all down. All right. So we've got a negative shape now made between, between the edge of our picture plane, the suit, and the man's head and hat. So study that shape in your own drawing. Okay. There's nothing there. Um, but the shape does have width and height, and that can help us a little bit. At least know that we're in the ballpark. Yeah. I'm not sure yet, but I am. We have another yeah. super chat, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. She says, this channel has taught me so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. You really appreciate it. I like that blue, too. Take another measurement. All right. I guess it's okay. I feel like I'm a little bit, little bit high with my hat. It's a high hat. I knew you'd like that one. Now, in the Surat images that we looked at, a lot of times the faces were really simplified into really sort of smooth you know, curves and cheeks. So I'm still trying to find um, a pretty specific profile of our fellow's face here uh, just because that's kind of my own personal inclination to do so all right i think i'm a little big so we'll bring that down looks like the the rounder bump on the back of this man's head is more straight across from his brow bone so i was a little high on the brow hey james asks do pan pastels draw for use in a sketchbook Pan pastels are basically dry pastels. They're basically soft pastels um, that are just applied um, with an, an applicator. I think they call it, I think the, uh, the manufacturer of pan pastels also makes the soft applicators. And I think the soft uh, is spelled with like an extra T or something. Um, something like that. <laughs> but it's basically pastels. So pastels are going to remain dusty unless you use a fixative to to keep them a little bit more in place. A fixative won't keep them completely in place, but it'll definitely help. Uh, but I would suggest maybe taking uh, a sheet of scrap paper or maybe some wax paper in between the sheets in your sketchbook uh, so that you're just to better ensure that the pan pastels or any pastel medium that you use doesn't smear on the back of the pages. Uh, so that's the approach I would take if you want to use pan pastels in your sketchbook. This um, hat does come really close to the top, and I might even be a little closer than in the reference. Enrique asks, do you have any course in the format of these 45-minute sketches? Uh, there is a course uh, called 25 Days to Better Drawings, and in that course, I take you through the core foundations and principles uh, of drawing. Um, and each lesson mm -hmm. is considered a day, so you could go through the course in 25 days, Although you don't have to do that. It's basically 25 lessons. And each lesson includes a 45 minute to an hour long drawing exercise. So it's it's not the same thing as getting sketchy. Getting sketchy, what we do here is is really meant to be a little bit entertaining, of course, with a little bit of information filled in. The courses are definitely focused on information, uh, a lot of information, um, and the drawings are definitely more polished than what we do here on getting sketchy. But as far as the courses go, I think that's the one that's closest because each uh, lesson has a, a 45 minute to an hour long drawing exercise. All right, we've got another super chat. All right. Thank you, Brenda. Yeah. And again, right. just like June, I, I feel like we feel like we know Brenda too. Uh, Brenda says, the membership program is the best. It changed my life. Wow, thanks, Brenda. I can't begin to recommend it enough. There's nothing to lose with the introductory free lessons and money back guarantees. So, thank you so much for that, Brenda. That's awesome. And thanks for your super chat and your support. We really appreciate it for sure. So we, we got lucky here a little bit in this drawing. We're looking at the man from slightly up from the back, so we just see a little bit of the detail of his face. Uh, we'll point out that um, the bottom of his ear is straight across from the top of the portion of the nose that we're able to see. So that's how I found the, the ear just kind of floats out there by itself, so it's a little hard to find. And so I used the nose... Well, I use the profile of the face to find the nose and then the nose to help me find the ear. So these little smaller features kind of build on top of each other. Do have a little split 
in the hair where the light meets. So I'm just going to go ahead and indicate that a little bit with an extra contour line. And it kind of looks like the, the Harry Potter lightning bolt. <laughs> and, so we'll and try this, to get rid of that. This is an excellent <laughs> reference uh, for the style of drawing you're creating here in the, the style of Surratt. Because uh, there's a lot of high contrast right. between light and dark. Yeah. And you can almost see a diagonal. If you kind of squint your eyes, you like can this. see that the upper left-hand corner or the upper left-hand side is light in value. Oh, yeah. And that. then it's mostly darker on the lower left-hand corner. Like but without that, you know, with the exception of the big old newspaper. But, yeah. uh, I'm not sure who the main character is. It might be the newspaper. Well, I would say that it's the headline that's the focal point. Yeah, probably so. Because he's looking at it. It's a little off-center. It kind of mm -hmm. fits in the upper third, kind of. It's pretty close to it. You've got all those guiding lines of the the bus seats right. or whatever Everything vehicle coming, he's sitting in. Coming down to it. Right. And the, the paint, the His window, gaze. the, the yeah. edges of the windows. So there's a lot of guiding lines to that very menacing text there on the, on the newspaper. All right, and then there's a big crease that runs through the middle. That's pretty important. There we go. All right, paper is in. Now we'll just throw in, um, I'm really going to look at the light shapes in the background. There's a, there's a woman on the other side of the newspaper, and I'm just going to pretend like she's part of the black shape right now. We may find her, or she may just get, get lost in the darkness. And I think there's a little bit of discussion. I'm trying to read uh, all the comments if I possibly can. It does go pretty quick, but I think some people are uh, asking about the forum that we have over the virtual instructor. Uh, the forum is completely free. You, you do have to create an account there, but uh, it doesn't cost anything to join the for forum and be a part of the community over at the virtual So uh, hopefully that helps those of you who are kind of talking about that. All right, almost done with the drawing, and we'll move on to the charcoal. Um, let's see. I guess I'll carry this fold out a little bit further. I mean, we're going to lose some of these little lines in the charcoal anyway, so there's really, really no point in drawing much of what's on the back of the suit. All right, I think my hard edges are in. Yeah, that initial drawing looks really accurate. I was shooting for 10 minutes. And you nailed it. Nailed it. All right, so that gives us uh, 35 minutes uh, to work with our charcoal. So I'm going to, you know, it is charcoal. I don't want to smear because I want to, um, I want the dimply pattern of the stipple paper um, to, to really um, show, to be visible everywhere. A lot like the work that Surratt did on the type of paper that, I'm sure it wasn't B Company paper, but he had an <laughs> interesting um, paper choice that did it didn't really have marks or lines. It kind of felt like maybe a slightly larger version. It definitely did have a pronounced texture. Yeah, it's it's yeah. strong, and he was using it, mm -hmm. and it doesn't look like he smeared down into it. So I'm gonna try to work this way for a lot of the drawing, just to keep myself from pushing too much of the charcoal down into the lowest pits of our stipple paper. All right. Oh, there is a little little sliver of light over here. We'll put that in. All right, here we go. I'm looking for a flat spot, and if I don't have one, I'll make one here in just a minute from our strokes. The strokes are a little bit hidden because of the texture of the paper, and that's another nice thing about it. I'm going. I'm working relatively light right now, so hopefully you guys can see that see that texture well. Of course, you can work on any paper you want to. It doesn't have to be. Um, stipple style paper but it, it i think that i'm gonna like this paper it does really give your drawing an atmospheric look where you can almost see the the thickness of the air yeah yeah and uh you know paper choice is part of the artistic process or canvas choice or whatever your your materials are part of your process too they count Of course, we'll get darker up there. Just uh, looking for, looking for edges tonight. I I wanted to make sure, you know, that it, that it would be difficult for me to be too detailed. So I'm drawn with a stick tonight instead of a charcoal pencil, and it does make it 
a little more challenging around the edges, but uh, Surratt had a lot of really soft edges in his artwork, so they may soften by default just because of our material choice. Okay, we have another super chat. Oh, oh, we got right. some with the super yeah. chat tonight, and this is uh, by Mary Elizabeth, and she says, "Can I change my monthly membership to yearly?" And you can. Um, all you have to do is cancel your monthly membership, let it expire, and then log in as normal, and then choose the yearly option. And uh, you will start a new subscription when you do that. Uh, that will be good for 365 days from when you start. Thank you for that, Mary Elizabeth. We really appreciate it. And someone says that, let's see, who was it? Oh, Orion Nebula says, so according to the Library of Congress, page I ended up on. He is in a San Francisco streetcar in December of 1941. That is amazing detective work. Holy moly. Orion Nebula. And you know, I watched a movie last night from 1983 yeah. about New York and oh, San yeah, yeah, Francisco yeah. being blown up yeah. by nuclear bombs. <laughs> it was called Testament. It was on Paramount Plus. It scared me to death. And um, and now here we are looking at a man on a streetcar reading about bombs falling on know, potential with, bombs falling on New York. The so. news today, that's something we really don't want to think about. <laughs> that's right. But Mary Elizabeth has given us another super chat. So thank you, Mary Elizabeth. And uh, she says, also love this show. I look forward to it. Well, thank you. And thank you for being a part of it. Brazen Spirituality says, Matt, will there be a Black Friday sale for memberships? Thanks. Um, I only do 30% off discounts, and uh, that's that's as low as it will go because that's really, that's really, really cheap for what you get. The regular price is pretty cheap, uh, honestly. Uh, but what you need to do is visit the site, click on the Join button, and and you might, might there might be a, there might be a sale going on there. You might want to check that out. Just have to go look, I guess. <laughs> see what's going on over there. Might be there. a sale that hasn't been advertised yet. We'll, we'll see. All right. We're pretty dark. And, you know, I don't want to destroy all of the texture of the paper. Or not destroy it. I don't want to hide it all. So I'm going to use something like this for our, for our black. And, you know, honestly, with my experience with the paper, it is hard to make a section completely black. It's hard to get down in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such a tight tooth. It is. A tool uh, like this probably just won't fall down in there. Right. You have to be willing to sacrifice some details if you work on this paper. Yeah. Which is perfect for for the Surratt esque drawing. Yeah, that's, that uh, that's what I was thinking. Um, let's see, Rebody, Rebottle. Re I I know I completely mispronounced that name. Ask, could I do this drawing with charcoal pencils? And the answer is absolutely yes. Oh yeah, you could do this drawing with any medium that you want. But to get that look that Ashley's getting, uh, the paper is is really important. Um, yeah. I'm thinking of some other papers you could substitute and maybe a cold press watercolor paper. Right. Especially if you worked in a larger square, it might feel the same. Yeah. You know, the texture is a little bit larger, but if you were working like doing a 12 by 12 or 10 by 10, it may, um, very much resemble this B paper. And... The pronounce the correct pronunciation is Hriba. So, thank you for that. And I I hope I pronounced the the correct pronunciation <laughs> correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just going after the darkest spots right now. Right. So we've got them in the background. We got a little spot in here to do. Then mm -hmm. we're going to jump down in the bottom, kind of work our way back up because it's very dark. I here already also. really like this drawing. <laughs> Uh, I'll re I think the subject matter spot on, the uh, the lighting within the scene spot on, and the paper medium combination is going to be a real Surratt-esque yeah, drawing. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Yeah. All right, let's keep going with this dark area right in front of our face. I noticed in a lot of his drawings that the uh, the paper seemed to have kind of an an off-white appearance. Right. Yeah, and I think that was 
you know, more common in the past, paper was not bleached out as much. Do you think that was due to aging or do you think that was? No, I I think it's original because sometimes he would use a little bit of white charcoal. That's true. Yeah. Or some other white uh, medium. And he was able to do that. He wouldn't have made that choice if the paper was, you know, gleaming white to begin with. Okay. Reba has made it very clear. They say I'm from the South. It's like Reba McIntyre. Okay. That's, that's all you got to say. Um, I understand Reba. In fact, I, Reba. I loved the show Reba. And I, I know that it was maybe not the most popular show. That's right. But did. that's because not enough people watched it. Not it, because it was the a show great was show. Bad. Oh, no. It was a great show. Yeah, I, I remember love the show. characters on that show. Uh, All right. So we're going to go ahead. Um, the, this triangle down here is pretty dark. It's got a soft edge on its the top of the triangle. But we're going to go ahead and hit that. Another thing that's great about this paper is how quickly you can develop the values. It oh, yeah. seems like the charcoal is uh, more controlled on the surface, and um, you can develop a range of value very quickly just by adjusting the amount of pressure you place yeah, on the paper. It, it is unique. All right, we've got another super chat. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are on fire yeah. tonight. And this is by Shellbell42 QBTL. Um, and they say, such a nice way to start my day off with you two. So thank you so much for starting your day off with us. So obviously you're in a different part of the world than we are. So we're doing a morning and, show. <laughs> right. I love it. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> As it has now just become dark where we are. Um, so... Uh, good morning to all of you guys who are watching this sometime in the morning. Okay, uh, Him Smith says, so just to clarify, Surratt would have used tiny little dots if he was using oils. Uh, if right. he was doing a pointillist painting, um, he would have uh, done small little dots. Dots yeah. of color. And as he got older, and remember, he didn't get very old, but as he got older, his mark making changed a little bit. And actually, he started using larger marks and even like these cool little pointy dashes, almost like little triangles coming out of his brush. So um, the painting that we looked at, the only painting that we looked at in our group of images, that's probably the the most... Um, like finely dotted artwork that he completed. And there seems to be a lot of confusion about pointillism in regards to stippling. Yeah. And uh, pointillism is when it's a painting process. And stippling is when you're making tiny dots with a pen or a, a drawing medium. And it's, and it's typically... It doesn't have to be. It's typically in black and white, but you can yeah. stipple with a color medium color. too. Yeah. But pointillism is uh indicates that you are in fact working in color because it was an exercise really in color theory right the optical color mixing is exceptionally important in pointillism yes um, where stippling is just dealing with values more like we're doing tonight but this isn't stippling no it's just on stipple paper. It's drawing on stipple paper. I know, paper. it makes it extra confusing. <laughs> I got stipple paper. But you can see the appearance, especially on the edge of the seat, the back of the seat, where right, it kind of transitions. Back, you, you can lighter. see it gives the impression of it being stippled. What kind of brush would he use? Him Smith follows up with. Uh, you have any idea? what he Did he use the end of a brush? I, I mean, I would assume he was using a round brush, you know, because they make more of a dot. Um, he was painting with oil paint, um, so I'm, I'm also going to assume that it was a bristle brush, but I can't, can't really verify that. He could have used some medium to thin his paint um, so he could get smaller and maybe more controlled dots and even used a pointy uh, watercolor brush, you know, when I just mean like a brush of softer bristles like a short handled brush typically the short handle brushes are for watercolor so i guess my final answer is i have no idea and his uh the most famous painting the one we saw at the end of the image um carousel right that painting is exceptionally large right it's the too. largest work he ever did that's why partly why it probably took him a couple of years right and um Edie adds and says that uh, pointillism is a kind or type of impressionism. 
Yes, it's very akin to Impressionism. Impressionism is what gave Seurat, I'm sure, the I initial idea. You know, painting those marks. Monet, I mean, he, Monet almost did it too. Um, but uh, he's classified as a post-Impressionist, which really means almost nothing. Van Gogh was also a post-Impressionist. <laughs> right, it's the period of time after Impressionism. Right, right. That they were all going were all in their over own the direction. And so post-Impressionism, I would say of the post-Impressionists, Surratt is the most like the Impressionists, you know, because he was really, really trying to capture and paint um, light and color. Very similar to Monet's goals as an artist. Now, um, I see that you're changing the direction of your your charcoal marks. Yeah. And up until I said that, you were going, I was going this way, horizontally this way, right? and vertically along the yeah. cross contours of the form of his back. Yeah, I'm, I'm changing directions just to just to negate the stroke a little bit. Right. Um, but I would say those are the two the two directions that are most contour, most cross contour like on his suit. All right, and of course this is one of the light. We got to get it up here into the hat. It's very close to black or black in areas. And then we're going to um, start to have to get uh, become a little bit more careful and start laying down some lighter values and think about the transitions. Now, I'm curious. It's not it's not visible on the feed, but is are the graphite marks you made do they have grooves in the paper or is that? No, no, they just skipped right across that bead, Perfect. that bead um, texture also. Mm. And so the paper I, is a little bit heavier than It, it normal seems drawing paper. really durable. Yeah. And it feels like 140 pound paper, you know, as far as. Um, to help you understand the surface and how it feels, it feels almost like you could pour water on it and it would just bead right off. Yes, it does. It's like it's plastic or something. It's like it's got a coating. The coating makes the drawing go down easier. Don't know that it does, but that's how it could just be the texture that creates that impression some, in some way. Okay, uh, Orion Nebula has an interesting comment. She says, I have trouble with fabrics, fabric folds normally. With the stipple paper, it looks even harder. Um, actually, in, with this particular subject, the wrinkles are, uh, you know, they're visible, but they're not like ridiculously pronounced. They're not real, yeah, they're not uh, too sharp or strong. Right, so you can just focus on the values that you see and the transitions of the values, and as long as you get the shapes of values approximately correct. That's what I was gonna say, try yeah. to see the shapes, you know, and I see the dark patch that's up here is, um, it's almost like an upside down trapezoid of darkness. This one's a triangle. So try to see the geometry in the folds, and not just in this drawing, but especially in, uh, in your other drawings, because there's oftentimes nameable shapes in fabric. And if you can name the shape, then you have gone through a brief process of analysis and you're more likely to, um, to capture it in a drawing. Yeah, so instead of thinking of them as being folds, just think of them as being shapes. That just kind of fit together like a puzzle. Right, and they don't have to be perfect either. All right. Okay, June asked, what mediums would work on this paper if you're using uh, a medium other than charcoal? Well, Matt used it with a pencil a few seasons ago. Well, I use it with a carbon pencil, which okay. is very similar to what you're That's doing true. here. Okay. Um, so I think that you can that. use a, a variety of different mediums. Um, I think, though, personally, I think the mediums that are going to work best are charcoal and Conte. Um, I don't really foresee you being able to, to use like watercolor. It's because, said for all dry media. Right. So they're yeah. discouraging that yeah. um, in their, on their packaging, really. Um, I think oil pastels would work on this paper. I haven't used oil pastels on this paper, but I do think that they would work because oil pastels stick to almost anything. <laughs> you, can, you can use oil pastels on the side of a telephone pole. Um, and we have another super chat. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Shell again. It's yeah. Shell Bell again. And she says, I'm Michelle from Sydney. It's 10.07 a.m. here. So good morning to you. 
Good morning. In Australia. On the other side of the world. All right. Oh, got a little bit of... And Reba suggests maybe pastel and... The, the thing that would uh, that would deter me from pastel on this paper, although it may work just perfectly on here, like I said, I haven't used pastel on this paper, um, is the fact that the pastel is pretty dry and the surface is very waxy. So I don't see it making a really good bond with the surface. Um, and that's just in my mind. Oil pastels, I don't think that would be a problem. But traditional soft pastels... Um, I don't know, but you know, the more I, I mean, think about it, we're, you're really using dry, charcoal. But yeah. I would point out this is compressed charcoal, but it's not crazy soft. Yeah, you know, it's it's little, kind it's, of a harder charcoal. Right, it's yeah. a little bit of a harder um, compressed version of charcoal. So, all right, it's time to start to getting into some of our grays now. So then maybe hard pastels would would work a little bit better on this paper. The new pastels. Yeah, the new pastels. Yeah, you're yeah. right. This stick of charcoal feels more like a new pastel. Yeah. So I would uh, think that's a good But you're good still going to have little specks of white show through. Just keep that in mind. Okay, buddy, ask, how does this paper behave in comparison with pastel mat? It is ridiculous, ridiculously expensive in Germany. What, pastel mat or this paper? Because <laughs> pastel mat is ridiculously expensive here in the United States. Um, pastel matte is got a finer texture associated with it. Pastel matte is almost honestly like a sandpaper, uh, or at least it feels that way to me. This paper feels like a waxy watercolor paper. Would you say that that's kind of how it feels? But it has a... It's it got the heaviness of watercolor paper. And it's got a consistent pattern, mm -hmm. unlike cold press watercolor paper, which has more of an erratic pattern. Um... It's kind of like a waxy version of pastel matte paper with uh, the texture is more spread out. So it's they're not the same, obviously, um, but they're not entirely different from each other either. <laughs> Buddy says, I thought new pastels are, old, are oil pastels. Wrong. Yeah, oil pastels um, have an oil binder, and new pastels are actually spelled N-U pastels. It's kind of a play on the word new. Yeah. And their new pastels are actually hard pastels. You know, we're familiar with soft pastels. In fact, most of the time when people refer to pastels, they're talking about soft pastels. Some people call them chalk pastels or dry pastels. New pastels are kind of a compressed version of that. Uh, so they come in sticks that are similar to the, the charcoal sticks that Ashley is using. Um, and the, the colors are just, um, it, the colors are the same as what you find in, in traditional pastels. But um, I would say there's less binder and more pigment. Would you say that's the case? What's or that now? Reverse? With new pastels compared to... I guess Soft so. Pastels. I guess that's what makes them a little bit, or maybe bit they're I, they may actually be compressed a little bit. Yeah, you know, under, yeah, I think under they're pressure. compressed. Yeah, that's um, what I'm thinking. Buddy asked, "Would you would it be great for waxed based colored pencils?" I think that this paper would you would go through pencils like crazy if you use this paper for colored pencil it would drawing. Just eat them up. And like I said, you can see the the pronounced texture of the paper. You're not going to get past that. Uh, so with a lot of pastel drawings, uh, you're kind of feeling in the tooth of the paper and you're wanting to burnish and create smooth transitions of color and value. With this paper, it's going to be hard to do that because you're always going to see those little white specks of paper showing through. Okay, so I'm using the side of my small piece now. And, uh, and it gets... Um, it darkens the paper a lot slower than the tip of the larger stick that I was using. And so I'm going to just uh, be building up layers and just gradually increasing my pressure and trying to save some of the um, lights and the midtones as I continue to build pressure and work my way down. So the little bit of drawing I did in the head, it's gone. I don't know what happened to that ear. It's under there somewhere. So we'll have to rediscover the ear. All right, so 
we'll go ahead and start to do that. Get a bit darker down here. And remember, um, Surratt's artwork is pretty soft in the faces without too much um, clarity through detail. Plenty of cl clarity or specificity, specificity to his his values and the form that he created. Okay, Mary Elizabeth asks, are you going to rub the charcoal or, or smear the charcoal? Not, in, not at all. And I do you think if you tried that, you would still see some little specks of paper show through. Um, and this is compressed charcoal, so it is um, not as dusty as vine charcoal. Um, so it kind of sits in place. And it's a little harder to smear, but it's also a little bit harder to erase as well. It's a little bit more permanent and darker. And I've, I don't want to disturb Ashley's drawing, sure. but uh, I brought over a few new pastels, so yeah. maybe you can hold them under the camera. Oh, yeah. And we may, at, we, I've at, got at extra uh, B paper, so we could actually make some marks. Okay. What, what yeah, decade really, is they're this They're really They're really old. Holy moly. Look at the price yeah. on it. Look at. 324. And look at where they bought, where we're bought from. Look. Kmart. Oh my God. I can't <laughs> believe that. The, the, these look, the design of the package looks like it's from 1983. Oh, it's from the 80s. Just like that movie yep. I watched. Yeah, they're yep. from the 80s. And uh, those are some leftover materials from a an art material hoarder who, oh, uh, yeah. who passed away and left all of her art materials to all the teachers in the county that Ashley and I used to yeah, teach. Yeah, I actually um, got some of those materials and used them. I'm glad to use them. She was a collector, like some of you guys probably are, and I am as well, of art supplies. There's there's art materials I own that I will never use. I just look at them. <laughs> Very similar. Well, you can really see the atmosphere in her drawing already. Because of the subtle value changes in the back of his head. And the yeah, back it's of starting his to happen a little bit more now. Yeah, it definitely looks serratish. And uh, we've still got a lot of light values um, to put in. And so. very quick, too. I really like, really like the look of this. All right, so I'm going to, you know, the whitest part of the picture is this piece, this area of the newspaper. And I don't want that to remain, so I am going to... Just with a light touch, start finding the grays that are outside of our window. That also helps with the little um, highlights on the jacket and head, where some of the some of the sunlight is coming in. And Brenda says, "My new pastel sticks are from Prismacolor," and yeah, that's that's who makes them now. <laughs> um, so, New Pastel was once its own company. I think it was made by. There's a different company name on that package. Oh, okay. Um, but and I think by, judging by the age of the package, um, they're, I don't know if they could be categorized as new pastels. Since These are, they're a couple decades old. Yeah, they're going to have to come up with a new name. But they're still very usable. I've used them in several pieces. Um, but... For the most part, when I need a hard pastel mark these days, I typically use a pastel pencil. Just some little staccato marks out here. Don't know what we're looking at. There we go. All right. Well, we've been saving the uh, the newspaper, the newspaper for close to last. So I'm going to go ahead and get in the newspaper. Then we can start judging it and making some adjustments. I think I need to get for as you know as time allows. There we go. Okay. So because of the crease in the newspaper, we definitely have a gray. under the, you know, under the crease. And just trying to barely float our material over the paper for some of these lightest grays. 
I'm trying to get up against the contours with uh, this little chunk in my hand is challenging. Just doing some tapping with the old kneaded eraser. This, uh, it, there's four sides on here, and I can't figure out which one I was drawing with, so I think this is it. You have a 25% chance of uh, guessing correctly. That's all I need. 25. And that's got to be a extremely light touch. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm holding it off the paper. I'm not letting the weight of my hand go down right now. And uh, Brazen Spirituality says, who has a fire alarm going off? That's not the fire alarm. That just indicates that our pizza is ready. <laughs> uh, actually, it's it's not. It's uh, a dehumidifier. Um, and once it's full, it beeps. Uh, so <laughs> sorry about that. That's happened uh, quite a few times here on Getting Sketchy for some reason. It's it always full, full this of time water. of day. I guess that's what yeah. it is, maybe. Well, it's, it, yeah, it's. It fills up a lot. There's a lot of moisture. All right, let's see. Buddy says, Ashley, this really does look like stippling on the screen. Great piece of art. Yeah, it does. I'm happy happy with the paper selection. And Dale, mm -hmm. I agree. I do think that the subject does look like FDR. <laughs> I was trying to get Matt to give me a piece of this B paper for the last like four weeks just to experiment with and see if I wanted to use it. And I kept forgetting to leave with it every Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. So I ordered a pad and I'm so glad I did because I'm, I'm going to need more than one sheet of this, I think. Yeah, that, this is uh, this drawings inspiring me to do some more drawings with the paper, too, because it it's so quick what you can develop in such a short period of time. All right. When you almost leave out details, you know, right. And you're kind of forced to. Yeah, the paper in, um, pushes you to leave out details. The charcoal sticks push you to leave out details. And uh, and the timer pushes you to leave out details. <laughs> <laughs> but you still have five minutes remaining, and you've yeah. got a fairly complete-looking drawing it's, there. It's close. It's close. At least, you know, for what we do here on Getting Sketchy, I'm going to put a little, um, put the pattern in the back of the seat. Or at least just indicate that with some dash marks. Nothing specific. We're not drawing contours and then kind of shading them in. Just putting little dash marks through here. The pattern will add a little bit of... It'll ground it, add a little weight to the bottom of our picture. And at this point in the drawing, all you can really do is decide what needs to be darker. There's always something. Or if you wanted to make an area appear lighter, you could make an area next to it darker. That's true. Um, but he says, if the reference photo were colored, how would you evaluate the grayscale just by experience? Uh, yeah, you could you could do it by looking at the, the reference and trying to match values. And it does take a little bit of practice to learn to evaluate uh, colors. One thing you can do with modern technology, of course, is you can always take a colored image and bring it into Photoshop, take the color out. You can take that one step you, Matt, further. you can do that with your phone now. I guess you can do that with your phone now. Yeah. Uh, you can take that one step further in Photoshop and then isolate it down to like four or five or six values if you want. And what the program will do is uh, simplify the values and make basic shapes of those values. So if you're learning how to evaluate values and how to add them in your drawings, that's one way you can do it. It's also a little bit of a cheat code uh, for those of you who want to make sure your values are accurate and you have this, the accurate shapes of value. Uh, we cover how to do that in the course Basic Photoshop for Artists, uh, which is part of the membership program. So if you're a member, you have access to that course. And uh, of course you do have to have Photoshop uh, but uh, Photoshop, I feel like, is a tool that really any artist needs uh, because and photographing it's not as, art. Uh, it's not as cost restrictive as it used to be because oh, you can all. rent yep. it instead right. of having to buy the whole suite um, for um, you know hundreds and hundreds of dollars. <clears throat> but photographing your art is obviously important, and cameras, no matter how good they are, seldom accurately photograph your artwork. Um, and that means that you usually have to do some type of um, 
photo editing. Some fixing, yeah. yeah some photo editing bit. and Photoshop is perfect for, for doing that. So I do feel like if you're an artist that's sharing your art, then Photoshop is something that you really need to have access to. Yeah. Or you can pay a photographer <laughs> to photograph your art and then they'll use Photoshop to, right. to fix it. Be like, boy, your photos look great. Mm. And there's still Photoshop in there. And it's fun to learn to use Photoshop. I'm, I'm teaching a digital art class right now, and I'm learning to do all kinds of things in Photoshop that I've never actually had to do. And um, it's really, it's kind of expanding for me. So I've been enjoying learning more about Photoshop in the last uh, couple of months myself. In fact, Matt, you'll be pleased to hear we're about to do a rotoscoping project with oh, Photoshop. Oh, nice. In Photoshop? Yes. It's perfect for that. And I actually have a video on how to do that on you know, YouTube. I'll be sure to show that in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll watch the AHA video, then we'll watch your video. And also watch the video um, that I published that says, is, is it okay to trace an art? Oh, right, because, because that's, that is the process. That a lot video, of it. I rotoscoped the video, <laughs> and only a couple uh, people caught that I was making art by tracing right, right. to explain why tracing is an acceptable form of art that's, making. And you didn't, you didn't highlight that. You didn't point didn't, that out. I didn't point that out. That's I was funny. hoping people would be smart enough to pick up on it, but yeah. well, only a couple people picked really up on it. Only if you've been <laughs> exposed to that animation process i would say would you pick up on that maybe but you know there's a lot of there's a i see rotoscoping or at least a few years ago i was seeing it all over the place oh it's all over making the place movies now. that yeah. way whole whole movies yeah. commercials all kinds of different places all right mm, i'm looking for looking for things to do I and, think we're about there with this one, it's and just because Mar of the style of the art. Margaret uh, says the AHA video, and yes, the AHA video is rotoscoped. Yep. Um, it's and one of the I can't imagine um, how they did that back then in the they 80s. They drew on the film. They were drawn directly on film. Well, not necessarily directly on the film. They or were using the film, over. and, and pro they probably projected it a little bit yeah. to create a, a larger drawing. Okay. But that's the only way I can imagine they did it is frame by frame with the film. Yeah. And they like probably physically. made it like 12 frames per second or something like that. They right. probably didn't And that's do what we're going to do is probably frames 12 frames a second. Something it, like you can that. even go to eight. And I'm going to keep, and it's going to keep my kids busy for like weeks. <laughs> So, but uh, it's great. They're gonna. I'm sure they're gonna love it. All right, I think I'm good. I'm finishing what I what uh, I think I'm finishing right right as the timer elapses. I guess I could tone that down a little bit. But again, I don't want to try to be too specific in there. It's got to kind of feel like a Surratt. You know, some of these um, some of these artists we have to pull back a little bit. You know, or push ourselves into a place that we don't normally, uh, typically, um, or, or might not be inclined to make those decisions in our own artwork. And so, I think it's great to copy other artists' artwork. And uh, that used to be art education was copying other artists' artwork at least a long time ago. You know, I used to do an assignment where I assigned um, the students in the class and art that I thought uh, an artist that I thought that they could relate to. It could like learn and something had from them create. They had to create a piece of art in that they had to create a copy of that artist's artwork yeah. and then present it to the class as the artist. Oh, I see. Um, and I had some That's spectacular fun. results from that. Yeah. Um, a, a, I had a couple of Van Gogh paintings that were awesome. I, I remember had a, you had a, a Jackson Greek. Pollock that was not splatter painting. No, it was not. It was that was a uh, Norman Rockwell painting, and that was, was David that I assigned each year. Whoever the most skilled artist was, I gave them Norman Rockwell. And you'll remember the year that Jay had yes. Norman Rockwell. He did. I still have a. I the, still have a photograph of that artwork. He did the painting the same size. As, as the Rockwell, the Rockwell painting, and the painting is better than the Rockwell painting. <laughs> um, and then David, it is very good. David did the that Norman Rockwell piece that shows a man in an art gallery looking at a oh, Jackson yeah. Pollock painting. Oh yeah, he did painting. a great job with that. So that it's a realistic painting, obviously, but it is it it is a splatter painting in, in there, the painting in there, right? 
and uh, God, David did a fantastic and job. Yeah, I that. have both of those paintings still in a PowerPoint. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I guess we should zoom in, get a good look at the texture of the paper. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. I'm going to slide this over a little bit as we go. Yeah, there you get yeah, a really good look at the really texture. You really see um, the dimples and the dots on the paper. So, I mean, that is... There's nothing. There's it, really nothing like that. It's kind of like a unique pattern too. It's yeah. It's not necessarily dots. They're like little raised bumps. Almost. Right, and they're not perfectly distributed, but uh, they're so small they can almost feel that way. Yeah. And then of course we'll zoom back out, let all those little dots come back. Well, together. that's a fantastic drawing. I think that that is highly successful. Thank you. Especially after looking at the Surat images, and this this looks like it could have been created by Surat. Mm -hmm. Obviously not in the same time period. Right, but, right. Um, but I didn't have any photographs from the 1880s. Yeah, but this, this works great. <laughs> uh, the lighting is uh, really nice. I thought it was a good. It feels like his sort of quiet subjects with a lone figure yeah. thinking to themselves. And uh, I feel like we captured that um, atmosphere that was so common to his charcoal drawings and his paintings too. But I've always loved his charcoal drawings. So I'm glad I got to... Um, share my love for Surat charcoal drawings with you guys tonight. Well, awesome. Well done. Thank you. Um, Thank you. In the time remaining, I brought those uh, new pastels yeah. over. Maybe we can make a couple marks on the B paper and just see, because I'm curious. I brought a scrap to for that kind of for that purpose. So here's a scrap. Let me go ahead. We'll just slide this guy over. Just slide him over. There we are. Okay. And open up our ancient the new pastels. <laughs> <laughs> you can see how much I used them when I when I got them. Oh, they yeah. were brand new. Oh, they weren't brand new, but they were unused. All right, let's see. <laughs> Let me pick a. Now I want to draw something else. I'm trying to think of a subject. I know. I can't it. wait to draw something with the B paper. <laughs> I might do a little landscape, make a video out of it. Right. Already, it's, I can see that those new pastels are dustier than the, the yes, compressed charcoal. Yeah, they're definitely so softer than the piece of compressed charcoal that I was using. Which makes me think that traditional soft pastels are going to probably not stick very well to the surface. Not like they would on a pastel matte paper. Right. So that answer, was that Buddy's question before? How would this kind of compare to pastel Somebody matte? Somebody asked, um, or it was brought up in some way. So... You can see that it's, I, I don't think Ashley's taking it that far yet, but I wonder if the white dots could be eradicated at any point. I don't think, I you think they'll always down on be this there. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, so you're always going to have those little white specks. Let me see, let's get some. Oh, I'm pushing down a little harder now. Now that's working it in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it is. And there actually, is some blending happening there. So. Getting down in there. Yeah. And let's put some yellow down here. June says, this is amazing. Ashley, you are an inspiration. Buddy says, Ashley, this is great. Keith well, says, nice glad, work. Looks good. Glad you guys have liked the, the show tonight. And hopefully you've um, enjoyed the whole season like we have. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting down in there. Yeah, so a few layers, maybe a little bit of blending. You might get away with yeah. it. And Buddy says that she did have... Of course, this is a softer medium, so I don't know if the charcoal would get down in there in the same way, or at least the stick that I was using. I do see, though, that you're going to be fighting the, the white specks. Yeah. So you will have to layer All right. quite a bit there. Let's see. Where's my white? Looks like a little coin. It's a grape. A grape. It's a little grape. Looks delicious. I don't know that it looks <laughs> like a grape. There we go. We'll get our fingers in here. That always helps. So that'll get it down in there. Yeah. So it does It does blend into the paper. Yeah. So once you press it down in there, it feels pretty, pretty firm in there. All right. Now it's a grape. That's a grape drawing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Super. So you could use it with the new pastels. It is going to be dusty, and it's going to wear them down pretty fast, I think. Um, Hemsmith 
ask if you'll do a close up if you'll of close, the grape of the grape yeah <laughs> or that dark blob i have that i keep calling a grape well now that we know it's a grape it looks like a grape there we go yeah it looks more like a grape the more we zoom in <laughs> and let's see i guess we could now look at that. There's no telling what's on that balloon. That's side. lifting it up a little bit. It is. Took a little bit with it. I'm surprising. So yeah. some of this, you know, it makes me feel like, it makes me think the paper's made of plastic, Matt. Yeah, it's not sticking. Yeah. It's yeah. not sticking that great. I, um, I, I actually like what it did to my grape. Right. It, it made that lighter side <laughs> a little improved bit lighter. It, I think it improved a little bit, but uh, you would definitely need to fix this or protect it in some way because it doesn't feel like it gets down in the fibers. I don't think you can get down in these fibers. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if there, there are, are fibers. even fibers. Right. <laughs> now, you know, you can, we're close enough now that you can kind of see that it's almost got a little shine to it, the paper, when you look out in the white area. Yeah. This is what keeps making me feel like it's got a coating on it. So, all right. Well, I've enjoyed uh, messing around with this paper a little bit more. And, you know, um, you know, playing around with this bee paper has given me an idea, too. So, oh, goodness. Um, He's I'll got another talk idea. To you about that uh, when we're done here. Okay. So. That sounds good. Um, here we are. All right. Well, excellent job there. And, Thank you. Uh, thanks you guys watching this and being with us and thanks for all the super chatters and oh for sure thanks for all of you wherever you are i hope you are safe and healthy let's let's go ahead and switch back over here let's do it all right guys thanks for joining us uh for getting sketchy tonight i hope you enjoyed it uh, don't forget that next week we're going to be taking a look at all of the drawings that we created this season and we're going to be critiquing them very quickly and we're going to talk about uh, the things that we like about the drawings that we created and the things that we wish we would have changed and done differently so um that might not sound as exciting as watching us create a drawing but trust me it's a valuable uh video to watch because uh, you'll see where we struggle and uh, we'll also, uh, you know, make suggestions on how we could have improved the drawing. Yeah, and that's how we learn which, and grow. Right, you know, which is exceptionally process, important for growth. And that's also a feature that we have over the membership program. The weekly members minutes are actually critiques of artworks that uh, members submit. And um, critique is an important part of growing and learning as an artist. And it doesn't necessarily mean critiquing your own art, although that's very valuable. But you can learn a lot from looking at other people's art and seeing it be critiqued because um, a lot of the, the principles that make a good piece of artwork are uh, pretty universal and mm -hmm. we can analyze them in lots of different pieces of artwork. So um, anyway, Ashley, do you have anything to uh, follow up on? Uh, I don't think I have anything to add. I hope I see you here um, next week while we wrap this season up. and. Uh, we'll see. Matt and I will talk about next season and see what we have in store for you guys. I'm sure it'll be exciting as well. So draw something between now and next week. Absolutely. Um, so again, uh, if you like this video, make sure you give it a like. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell. And for those of you who are, are going to be a part of the live lesson in just a few minutes, we will see you guys then. We will try to do all our shifting and things uh, really quickly there. So That's we, right. So we don't have any technical difficulties. I shouldn't have said that. Uh -huh. uh, I shouldn't have said that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, you guys have a wonderful week. Um, and we'll see you right here next week uh, for our last episode of this season, season 11. Uh, good night, everybody.